I want to spend the remaining minutes of class talking about uh, the speed of light and specifically how we can measure perhaps the speed of light and some historical methods that have been used to measure the speed of light. We're going to start off with Galileo. Galileo performed an experiment a few hundred years ago, pretty simplistic experiment, but um, pretty intelligent actually in its most basic form. Uh, Galileo started off with a couple of hills a kilometer apart. And on each of these hills, he's got a lantern and a guy. He's on the first hill. We'll call this hill number one. Okay, his assistant is on the second hill, hill number two. Each of them have a lantern. A lantern that's lit with a flame, right? He's got the lanterns covered up with a sheet or with a blanket or some kind of whatever. So you can't see the light coming out of it. Galileo standing over in here on hill number one uncovers his lantern all of a sudden. When he does that, the light starts shining out in every direction, including towards hill number two. So the light now travels from hill number one towards hill number two. When his assistant on hill number two sees the light from hill number one, he uncovers his lantern. Now that light starts shining in every direction, including back towards hill number one. Now Galileo sees the light coming from the lantern on hill number two. Think about what's just happened. Galileo uncovered his lantern. The light traveled towards hill number two. Guy uncovers his lantern, light covers, travels towards hill number one. Galileo has just made light travel from one hill to the other and back again. If he can just time that, then he can easily measure the speed of light. So he takes some kind of crude timing mechanism. I don't know what he would have used to time this. Measures the time that it takes the light to travel that two kilometer round trip. And then says, well, look, this is easy. All I got to do is... Divide the distance by the time, the two kilometers, by the time that it took me to, took the light to travel that two kilometers, I got the speed of light. What's the problem with this experiment? Why does this experiment give us a completely irrelevant value for the speed of light? Even if it does happen to be close, it would be purely coincidental. There's no significance to the value that he calculates whatsoever. How come? How come, Ethan? It's reaction time. The reaction time is huge here. The reaction time of literally timing, but also the reaction time of uncovering the lanterns. If it takes a half a second to uncover the lantern, think about that. Remember what I said the other day about the speed of light? Light can make about 30 return trips across Canada in one second. If it takes him a half a second to uncover a lantern, light could have traveled 15 return trips across Canada in that time. The time, the reaction time here is so gigantic compared to the time that it actually takes the light to travel that any value he actually gets for time and therefore any value he gets for velocity is going to be completely meaningless. It's a good idea and it would work great if the speed of light was significantly less. But since the speed of light is a billion kilometers per hour, the reaction time involved in light traveling two kilometers is always going to be ridiculously huge. And therefore, the value that you're going to get for the speed is going to be ridiculously wrong. Connor? Okay, let's zoom forward a little bit and talk about another experiment. Mickelson's experiment um, was uh, different in the sense that um, it didn't require anybody to use a stopwatch. We didn't have to physically measure time by hand. Um, let me describe what happens here, okay? Uh, Mickelson's setting up this experiment on two hills as well. These hills are 35 kilometers away. Now, that distance is still ridiculously small compared to what we would need if we were using some kind of human reaction time, right? But 35 kilometers is better than one kilometer. Mickelson shines a light on Mount Wilson 35 kilometers away from Mount Sant Ant San Antonio. He flashes a light here towards this mirror, to, towards, sorry, towards this octagonal shaped object here, which looking at it from above, rotates like this. All of these sides have a plain flat mirror attached to them so that when light hits one of those sides, it will reflect. If we shine a flash of light from this light bulb towards side four, 
it hits that light, sorry, hits that mirror, reflects back down here, reflects back up here off of site six, and then reflects back right back here and gets observed by this observer. The observer sees the light. Now, we haven't found anything, but at least we're starting to get this set up here. The observer sees the light. That's what we want, right? But now if I start turning this mirror, start rotating it, let's say this beam of light just happened to hit side four and reflect down like this. During the time that it takes the light to go from side four back to side six and then go to the observer, this mirror has rotated. So maybe side six isn't where it was anymore. This light has gone down to Mount San Antonio, gets reflected back, hits side six, and then goes up like this somewhere. It never gets observed by the observer. So what do we do? Let's increase the frequency of the mirror a little bit, the rotating mirror. Let's spin it a little faster. If we spin it a little faster, maybe the light that went from side four down to Mount San Antonio and then back up doesn't hit side six at the right angle to get observed by the observer, but maybe now it hits side five at the right angle to get observed by the observer. So now we know that this mirror, this rotating mirror, has made one-eighth of a rotation during the time that it took the light to travel the 70 kilometers from the mirror and then back again to the mirror. Does that make a little bit of sense? Now, what happens if I increase the speed of the mirror even more? Don't see it again, right? Might reflect off of side five now, but gets reflected up here somewhere. It doesn't get observed. Increase the frequency a little bit more. What happens? Well, maybe now it reflects off of side four and gets observed by the observer. Now it's made two eighths of a rotation, or in other words, a quarter of a rotation. We need to know how much of a rotation it's made. Has it been one eighth or has it been two eighths? Well, if I start this mirror at rest and then I start increasing the frequency gradually, I'm not able to see it. I'm not able to see it. I'm not able to see it. There, I see it. Then don't increase the frequency even more. The first time the observer is able to observe it, when it's not standing still, that is, it must have made one eighth of a rotation. That's really important to know. Because if we know the frequency of the rotating mirror, how many revolutions per second it's making, and it could be a lot. It could be 600, 700, 800 hertz, 700 cycles or revolutions per second. If we know the frequency of that rotating mirror, we can pretty easily calculate the period, the time that it takes for one complete rotation. And if we can calculate the period, we could divide that by eight to get the time for one eighth of a rotation. And the time for one-eighth of a rotation is the time that it took the light to travel that 70 kilometers, 35 kilometers from Mount Wilson to San Antonio and then back to Mount Wilson again. If we know the time that it took to travel that 35 kilometers, and we know, sorry, the 70 kilometers, and we know the distance, the 70,000 meters, then we can, we can calculate the speed of light. And we get a much, much better value here than Galileo ever would have gotten Partly, a little bit, because the distance is now 35 times what the distance was, although that's still really, really small. Mostly because of what? Now we don't have human error. Like, we could be off in our measurement of the frequency of this rotating mirror. If this is rotating at 600 cycles per second, it would be easily be, we could easily be off by 30 hertz, right? Easily. 60 hertz. You're off by 5%, 10%. Imagine Galileo would have been off by a factor of 100,000 or by a factor of a million, not by a factor of 1 20th or 1 10th. So could we be off by this on this? Absolutely. Are we going to be much, much closer? Yeah. Even though it would be difficult to know the frequency of that rotating mirror, it's a lot easier to know ballpark frequency of the rotating mirror than it is ballpark how long it takes the light to travel two kilometers based on using a stopwatch and uncovering lanterns. 
This gives us a much, much better value. This is a more important experiment because the value is better. And you know what? Practically for us, we have to be able to solve these problems, these Mickelson problems. I've never seen a Galileo problem on an exam. Okay? This is on there almost every time. We have to be able to use this experiment to determine the speed of light. Yeah, Ethan? All right. How are we going to solve these problems? Well, we kind of addressed this already. In the end, good news is they're all the same. All these questions are the same. There, this is, there's nothing really more recipe-like in Physics 30 than this. And that's good news. We have to think hard in Physics 30. Every once in a while, it's nice to have a question that we just do the same way every time. That doesn't happen very often in Physics 30. It happened a lot in Physics 20, not so much in Physics 30. Every time you get one of these questions, here's what I want you to do. Every time. No exceptions. I want you to write down two equations. First one is going to be V is equal to D over T. We can use that because the light travels at a constant speed. The second one, I want you to write down T is equal to 1 over F. Now, understand that this little T stands for the time for one-eighth of a revolution, a rotation, I should say. Big T stands for the time for one complete rotation. It's the period, right? We would either know the frequency of the rotating mirror and end up solving for the speed of light, or we would know the speed of light and be solving for the frequency of the rotating mirror. Usually it goes, know the frequency, solve for the speed. But if we know the speed and we have to solve for the frequency, that's okay. We just do things in reverse. Here's what I want you to do after you've plugged, sorry, after you've written down these equations. I want you to sub numbers in. Whatever numbers you got, sub them in. Get something. You will end up getting first, in your first step, you will end up either getting T or little t. One of those two things, that's the first thing you're going to find, is big T or little t. And here's the thing, it's not the one you want. If I get big T, that's great, but I wanted a little t. If I get little t, that's great, but I wanted big T. The grass is always greener on the other side. The one that I get is never the one I want, never. The one that I end up getting first is never the one I want. So get the other one. If you get big T and you want little t, divide by eight to get little t. If you get little t and you want big T, then what are you going to do? Multiply by eight to get big T. So whichever one you end up solving for, get the other one, plug it into the other equation, and then solve for what you're looking for, either V or F. All right, let's do a problem. The set of rotating mirrors in Mickelson's experiment was rotating at 533 hertz. Like 533 cycles per second. Could we be off by a factor of, you know, I, I don't know, could we be off by 10%, 20%? Sure we could, sure we could. But being off by a factor of 10% on the frequency, if it say is way better than being off by a factor of 100,000 in the measurement of the time that it takes for the light to travel two kilometers. Curved mirror was located 35 kilometers away. The curved mirror, by the way, sometimes we draw that as a flat mirror down here on Mount San Antonio. Sometimes we draw it as a curved mirror. So if it says the curved mirror, we mean the second mirror. Show how Mickelson determined the speed of light from this data. Well, listen, we write down two equations. It's what we always do. V equals D over T, and T is equal to 1 over F. And then we start subbing in numbers. Uh, v, this is what we're trying to find, V. The distance would be 35 kilometers? Yes. Meters. Meters, 35,000 meters. Okay, is that is that what it is? Yeah. Nope, almost though. Oh. What? 70,000 meters. Divided by the time for one eighth of rotation. We don't know what that time is. So that wasn't very helpful, but that's okay. And we just we sub numbers in like we were supposed to do. We didn't get anything. So we'll go to the next equation and we'll sub numbers in there. Do we know what big T is? No, we don't. But we do know what the frequency is. It's 533 hertz. So let's get big T now. 
1 divided by 533 is 0.0. Now, I always tell you, keep the unrounded number till the end. We're dealing with such a small value, it's really important to keep the unrounded number. Don't round that to 0 0.0018 or 0 0.0019. Keep the unrounded number, four or five, four or five significant digits here. What have I just found there, by the way? No, nope, big T, which is the time for one complete rotation. What do we want? The time for one-eighth of a rotation, right? We want little t. Remember what I said? The time you get, you're always going to get the time. It's never the one you want. We got big T, let's get little t. We do that by dividing by eight. So little t, the time for one-eighth of a rotation, is that number divided by eight, which gives me 2.3452, 2.3452 times 10 to the negative four which we turn around and plug into here. Times 10 to the negative four gives me, um, let's see here, 70,000 divided by that number. 2.98 times 10 to the 8 meters per second. That's pretty good, eh? It's a little bit better than Galileo would have gotten. Our currently accepted value is 2.99 something times 10 to the 8. We say 3 times 10 to the 8 rounded to 3 digits. A couple words of caution before I set you free on some questions to work on. Sometimes a question will say, Will give you a distance other than 35 kilometers. So don't get in the habit of using 70,000 meters. Maybe you perform a Mickelson like experiment where the distance was 20 kilometers instead of 35. Maybe you perform a Mickelson like experiment where there was 16 sides on the mirror instead of eight sides on the mirror. So don't get in the habit of using eight either. Okay, if we change the distance to 20, 20 kilometers, then we just make this 40,000 meters. If we change the number of sides of the mirror to 16, well, instead of dividing by eight, we divide by 16. It doesn't change things really, does it? You just gotta be alert for things like that. Pay attention to things like that. All right, I'm gonna give you these three questions to work on. One more word of caution story before I set you free on that. Um, in question number two, uh, sorry, question number one and question number two, you're looking for frequency. You need to know a speed of light if you're solving for frequency. If you're not given a value, an experimental value, then you have to assume, assume the accepted value, which is three times 10 to the eight. So if you're not given a value for speed of light, don't assume three times 10 to the eight if that's what you're solving for. But if you're solving for frequency, then just assume the value that's on your data sheet three times 10 to the eight. All right, let's get moving on these, these three questions, please.